So we're going to continue this morning um, a series that I've been teaching at 10, and we're going to do the next installment of it right now uh, at our 11 o'clock service. This is week number five in a series uh, on the throne room, visions and revelations of the Lord. So after my teaching this morning, uh, we'll have a time uh, for prayer ministry. Um, So if uh, you walked in here with a burden today, or if the Lord brings something up during um, the service today that you want prayer for, uh, it's a good thing when you come to church to get some prayer. And so we'll have elders in the front this morning. Uh, so if you are sick in your body in any way and you want prayer for healing, uh, they're ready for that. That's following the model of James 5. If there's a burden, um, if you want to invoke uh, the principle that Jesus gave us of agreement, where if two or three agree on the earth on anything, that it will be done in heaven, this is a good place to invoke that promise. And so you can do that with an elder up front if you want, uh, for anything you want prayer ministry for This morning. But our teaching this morning will be on the throne room visions and revelations of the Lord. We get this phrase, visions and revelations of the Lord, from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 1, where Paul writes to the church of Corinth, he says, I will go on now to visions and revelations of the Lord. So he takes a shift in his letter and he's going to talk about this. And so I love that phrase. I want to be very Pauline when I talk about our experiences with the Lord. Uh, We want to be very scriptural when we do that. And so we are leaning into this scriptural phrase, visions and revelations of the Lord. Paul said elsewhere, he said, if you, Christian, have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above. The moment you got saved, you reached out to heaven. You turned the eyes of your heart to heaven, and with faith, you reached out and grabbed the hand of Jesus, and he clasped your hand, and he said, I'm yours, and you're mine forever. You sought things above. You you were convinced of, of, of a heavenly reality. You were convinced of the mortality of your own soul. In that moment, you were convinced that there's an eternal hell, and I don't want to go there, and there's an eternal heaven, and I really want to be there. So you sought the Lord. You reached out by faith. You touched heaven. Now, Paul says, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is right now, seated at the right hand of God. The Christ that saved you is a man who sits on a throne at the right hand of the Father. Keep seeking him and the place where he is. He said, keep thinking, keep thinking. Focus your mind on that place. Keep thinking about things above, not just the things of the earth, not just when you have to pick up your dry cleaning and when you have to go to work tomorrow and what your next route is and whether or not you think you can get a raise at another job. Don't only think about those things, but you need to keep thinking about things above. For you died. The old you died when you got saved and you have a new life that is hidden with Christ in God. In in some spiritual reality, the the new you is joined with Christ in the heavenlies. In order to make the most of your life on earth, you have to embrace that reality, that identity, that my life is hidden with Christ in God, that I'm a citizen of that place, and I'm only a pilgrim here. But that's my home. That's my reality. That's the ultimate reality. And now I want to live with an eye on that place. That's been the focus of this series of the throne room, visions and revelations of the Lord. There is a prophetic preacher um, about uh, 80 years ago named A.W. Tozer. How many of you have read a book by A.W. Tozer before? Anybody in here? I see a smattering of hands, like Pastor Ken says, like a bad arrival. Uh, all right, uh, A.W. Tozer, uh, his, most of his books are public record. You can get them either for free or really cheap. And my goodness, uh, he was a, a mighty prophetic preacher, pastor two churches simultaneously, right, Pastor Ken? One in Toronto and one in Chicago. And he would just um, um, ride back and forth. But here's what he had to say 80 years ago. He said, to regain her lost power, the church must see heaven opened and have a transforming vision of God. But the God we must see is not the utilitarian God who is having such a run of popularity today. You can see the kind of way that he spoke. Almost sounds like C.S. Lewis. He was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis. The God we must learn to know is the majesty in the heavens, the one on the throne. And that's from his book called The Knowledge of the Holy. The Knowledge of the Holy. To regain her lost power. 80 years ago, a prophetic preacher is talking about how he looks around the landscape of his church world 
and he sees a powerless church. Right? In the 1940s, 1950s, A.W. Tozer says, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Where's the power in the church? There's power in the lives of these believers written in the Bible that I read. Where's the power in the church? And he said, the way the church is going to regain her power is by getting a new vision of the Lord, a new revelation of the Lord, of the majesty on high, of the one who sits on a throne. I believe 80 years later that we are living in the prophetic fulfillment of this problem that he noticed two generations ago and that the power has come back to the church in measure. Now, globally, no, but in, in much greater measure than, than in the days of A.W. Tozer. The Lord has been doing amazing things in the last 80 years since A.W. Tozer um, articulated that plight of the church. And the church is regaining her power. Yes. And it's one of the things that the Lord has called this church to do is to uh, cooperate with Jesus, to see that the bride is walking in purity and power. So, today, we pull our, um, our vision and revelation from the Lord from the story of Micaiah. There's about 10 or 12 people who got a clear vision of the one on the throne. <laughs> Micaiah was one of them. And he's probably one of the least known ones. And so we're going to talk about Micaiah's war room vision. And then we're going to, answer the, we're going to ask the question, what does Micaiah teach us about the throne room, about that place that we should keep thinking and keep seeking? What does Micaiah teach us about the throne room? I'll have five statements, and that'll be the teaching for this morning. Are you ready to go on the journey? You ready? Okay, here we go. Amen. First, our story is found in First and Second Kings, and I got a sneaking suspicion that there's at least one person in this room who hasn't read First and Second Kings lately. All right. So, for you one, whoever that is in here, um, you don't have to raise your hand. Whoever that is, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you real quickly how do I think about First and Second Kings. First and Second Kings recounts the history of the nation of Israel, starting with the end of King David's life. That's First Kings one the end of King David's life, um, all the way to uh, the invasion of Babylon and the destruction of the temple about 400 years later. So two books, First and Second Kings, 400 years of history. David dies, and then Nebuchadnezzar comes in, and he sacks Jerusalem, he burns the temple, and there's about 400 years in between, and that's what First and Second Kings is about. They were written not during the time in which it was happening, but they were written during the time of the Babylonian captivity, written by somebody who was taken captive, sent away to Babylon, and now finds themselves living in Babylon, in Persia. And they're thinking, how did we get here? Like, is this a reality? How did all this happen? How, how is it that God's people who received the covenants and the promises are now in a foreign land as slaves again? Like, my Bible tells me that we were slaves once and then God freed us, right? The whole Egypt thing. How, how did this happen? How did we get back into slavery again? And so a prophetic history book needed to be written to answer the question, how did we get here? And so in Babylon, somebody, possibly Ezekiel, uh, wrote First and Second Kings as a prophetic history. It's not just any history. It follows a particular pattern. The emphasis of 1 and 2 Kings is on the 40 kings who ruled during this time, 40 kings, and their responses to the words of the various prophets who spoke during their rule. So we didn't just write everything we know about Jehoshaphat, everything we know about Ahab, everything we know about Manasseh. The writer chose specific things, specific times in their life where they encountered the word of the Lord and whether or not they obeyed or whether or not they disobeyed. And typically they disobeyed. So it's a selective prophetic history of the nation of Israel written on the shores of Babylon to answer the question, how did we get here? Bless you. And at the end of it, at the end of it all, like this big elephant in the room is, okay, God is still speaking prophetic words. There's still lots of prophets during the captivity. Um, in, in Babylon and post-Babylon. God's still speaking prophetic words. We see how that 400 years went. What are we going to do now with the prophetic word? Right? Ezekiel's still preaching over there. You hear him? What are we going to do with him? Because we saw what happened when we disobeyed the prophets. And so prophets make it into First and Second Kings like Nathan, Ahijah, Shemaiah, Jehu, Isaiah, Huldah, the prophetess. She's a great one. Uh, the court prophets of Israel. These were hired prophets 
Not, not, they were guys who learned how to sound like prophets, but they weren't really prophets. Uh, then the wicked prophets of Baal, hundreds of Baal prophets are in First and Second Kings. Um, then there's a, a guy named Elijah. You heard of him? Elisha, one of his students. And then another one of Elijah's students named Micaiah. And that's who we're talking about today. A student of Elijah in First and Second Kings who appeared before two kings at a very pivotal time in Israel's history named um, Micaiah. All right, so that leads us to 1 Kings 22, where we're going to find our story today. And we got two kings uh, in the story, King Ahab, uh, wicked King Ahab, uh, hiss when you hear his name, King Ahab, there we go, wicked King Ahab, like one of the worst kings in the world, married to uh, Jezebel, uh, a sweet lady, uh, married to Jezebel, and then in the south, you have Jehoshaphat, which was the name of every young schoolboy. like the favorite king is Jehoshaphat, because they had fat in the name, right? Uh, it was just so funny when I was a kid. Je- you think there's a king with a name fat in his name? Jehoshaphat, all right? It's actually a great name. Yeho is Yahweh, and Shaphat is the word judge. So Jehoshaphat is Yahweh's judge, which is a great name. Um, but nonetheless, wicked ki- King Ahab in the north and eh, a so-so King Jehoshaphat in the south. They had made an alliance together. Jehoshaphat al- allowed his son to marry Ahab's daughter. So these two kings were pretty close. So in verses 1 and 2, uh, 1 Kings 22, um, Jehoshaphat takes a journey up north and he goes to visit Ahab in Israel. These two kings come to visit each other for a few days. While they're together, King Ahab brings up a city that he wants to rule over that he's not ruling over. And the city's name is Ramoth Gilead. If you could see it on the map, it'd be right about where the word king is for King Ahab. Right about where that word king is, is where, is where Ramoth Gilead is. And, and uh, he says, hey, you know, we don't, we don't own Ramoth Gilead, and I want that space. And so he invites Jehoshaphat to join his army so that the two armies can go over and take Ramoth Gilead. It's just a, something kings talk about, right? So Jehoshaphat says, sure, I'm with you, man. Let's, let's, let's form a team. Let's go take Ramoth Gilead. But Jehoshaphat says, can we inquire of the Lord first? And uh, so Ahab's like, all right, fine, we'll, we'll inquire of the Lord. So King Ahab goes and he, uh, he summons 400 of his prophets to come so that they can ask whether or not they should take Ramoth Gilead. 400 prophets of Ahab come. Um, they're led by a guy named Zedekiah. So there's Zedekiah there. He made this... Uh, fancy horn hat, uh, to, uh, to, as like a prophetic display. Zedekiah and the 400 prophets come before Ahab and Jehoshaphat. And Zedekiah and the 400 prophets all say the same thing. Yes, go up and triumph. Yahweh will give it into the hand of the king. Go up and triumph. Yahweh will give it into the hand of the king. They all say the same thing. And Jehoshaphat says, now this is a little, this is a little uh, curious. How are all 400 of them saying the same thing? Really? Not one dissenter in the group? And so the... Um, um, the unanimous consent made Jehoshaphat leery. So Jehoshaphat speaks up and he says, but is there a prophet of Yahweh around that we could ask? I've heard what your 400 prophets say. How about a prophet of Yahweh? And Ahab's like, well, there's this one guy, but he's, well, well here, here's, here's an illustration to explain what he's like. All right, John, what do you see? Okay. Dustin, what do you see? All right. Josh, what do you see? A donut. I'll give one one more opportunity. Let's see. Chris, what do you see? A hole. There we go. That's what Micaiah was like. Where everybody else sees a donut, Micaiah sees a hole. He's a donut hole prophet, right? We didn't even plan that. That was great. That couldn't have worked out any better. Micaiah is a donut hole prophet. And every time he went to prophesy in front of the king, all he did was point out the negative. And Ahab hated that because Ahab liked it when people told him positive things. But Micaiah never did that. So Ahab's like, I got this one prophet of Yahweh, but man, is he annoying. He always prophesies a negative. And Joshua's like, is he a true prophet? Well, yeah, he's a true prophet. Well, then bring him here. So Micaiah gets summoned to come join the scene. And he gets coached along the way. And the coaching sounds like this. Now you do whatever, you, you make sure you tell the king what he wants to hear, which is that he can go take Ramoth Gilead. And Micaiah's like, I'm going to tell the Lord whatever I hear. So he comes and he stands before the king 
and he prophesies. Here's what he prophesies. Are you ready? Here it is. He's, he, get, he gives it in two visions. Here's the first vision. Micaiah said, King Ahab, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And Yahweh said, these have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. So Micaiah got a vision of the battle. And the vision is that um, all of Israel was scattered around. That's not good for an army to be. They should be like in marching in uniform. Um, and they're like sheep that have no shepherd. They're all running like sheep that have no shepherd. That's not good. And Yahweh says, these sheep have no master, meaning their master was just killed. So the master is going to be killed on the battlefield. Let each return to his home in peace. So the soldiers shouldn't have gone there. Let them go home in peace because now the king is dead. That's a donut hole prophet, right? That's a, that's, that's, that's a worst case scenario, Micaiah. Thank you so much. That's what he says. That's what I hear the Lord saying. Now, I think it's interesting to note that this phrase right here, as sheep that have no shepherd, is a phrase from Micaiah's Bible. This is a, a phrase that was found in, um, in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 27, verse 17. As sheep that have no shepherd, it's the same phrase. And it's what Moses says would happen to the children of Israel if he did not pass his anointing down to Joshua. Moses says, if I don't appoint somebody to lead you, you guys are going to be like sheep without a shepherd. You'll be scattered. And so let me anoint Joshua to take my place. And so I just love it that the first thing that Micaiah says is he quotes a Bible verse, something from his Bible. When we prophesy here at this house, we often ask the Lord, Lord, what verse do you want to remind this person of? Or what Bible story do you think this person needs to focus on at this time in their life? And that Bible verse or that Bible story will often anchor our prophetic message. Um, we don't just do that because it's safe. We also do that because that's how the prophets in the Bible did it as well. Okay, then he goes on and he gives the second part of his prophecy. Uh, funny, right after that phrase that I just read, right after that verse, Ahab said, I told you to Jehoshaphat. And then Micaiah continues. And Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne. Here we go. Here's the throne room vision. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And Yahweh said to the host of heaven, the angels of heaven, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? One said one thing and another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before Yahweh saying, I will entice him. And Yahweh said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, yeah, I like that plan. <laughs> you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. An omniscient God has opened up his throne room to suggestions and he listens to the voice of one spirit who comes forth. And he says, how do you think we should win the battle? An omniscient God asking a question of a created spirit. What do you think we should do? And valuing his input, valuing his mind and, and his strategy. And the Lord, the omniscient God saying, let's do that. Let's go with your plan. Whoa. Wow. Now, therefore, behold, Micaiah says, Yahweh has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these, your prophets. Jehoshaphat, you want to know why you thought, hey, uh, um, all, all 400 of them, all co uh, corroborating the exact same message, all echoing the same message. Jehoshaphat, you thought something was wrong with that. You're exactly right something was wrong with that. The reason why all 400 of these men all said the exact same thing was because the, Yahweh sent a lying spirit to convince all of them to bring all of them into a frenzy, saying, yes, 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 go out and battle. That way Ahab will listen to them, and Ahab will go out, and he will die on the battlefield, which is exactly what he did. We won't go into the story, but the next day he goes out, and he dies on the battlefield. Yahweh has declared disaster for you. All right, so what does Micaiah and this donut hole prophecy, what does Micaiah and this throne room vision that he sees, this conversation in the throne room, what does this teach us about the throne room since we are to be people of the throne room? Number one, the one on the throne is the Lord of hosts. We got a Hebrew name for you. 
Yahweh Tzavaot. Yahweh Tzavaot. That's how you say the Lord of hosts. The word Tzava could be host or it could be army. But the one on the throne, as Micaiah saw him, had the whole host of heaven, some on the right hand and some on the left hand. Now, the phrase Lord of hosts is not found in the first several books of the Bible. You won't find the phrase Lord of hosts until 1 Samuel chapter number one. Um, and it was then, uh, as the prophetic uh, ministry in Israel really got going, that you see the prophets focusing in and not just saying Yahweh, but saying Yahweh Tzavaot. The Lord of hosts says this. The Lord of hosts is doing this. And they began to see the Lord in light of his military leadership, in light of this army that he sends out and dispatches into the earth on behalf of Israel, the Lord of hosts. Um, um, see, Tuesday is Halloween, but for us, it's also Reformation Day, right? Reformation Day. In 1517, uh, Martin Luther, he nailed the 95 Thesis on the chapel doors, right? 1517, in case you don't know your history, it, that, that's a reality. And it happened on October 31st. Um, he was taken by the name Yahweh Tzavaot. He's got great sermons about it. He even put it in his most famous song. Let me show you. Uh, did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Tzavaot, his name. From age to age the same. And we must win the battle. There is a generational awareness in Martin Luther's day of spiritual warfare, spiritual realities, the evils that had saturated the Catholic Church, the warrior that Luther was called to be, right? And the Reformation as, as one of, of, of uh, God's strategies, one of his wartime strategies to purify the bride, to release them from heresy, to release them from the evil that the Catholic Church had become. And, uh, and he, took a lot of, uh, he, he took a lot of pleasure in understanding this vision of the Lord, that he is Yahweh Tzavaot, that he is the Lord of hosts. Now in the Bible, you see that uh, the Lord, uh, hosts can mean three different things in the Bible. Um, there are heavenly hosts. Those are like angels. There are cosmic hosts. Those are the stars and the planets and the moon. They're called the hosts of heaven. And then there's the hosts, which are the soldiers on the ground. So three different hosts and Yahweh is Lord of all of them. He's the Lord of all those heavenly beings. He dispatches them at his will. And he's the Lord of the trillions and quadrillions and multiplied out of stars and planetary systems that he's created. And he's the Lord of all human armies. I think it's good to remind ourselves that warfare is a constant reality to the Lord. Warfare is a constant reality to Jesus. It's only an occasional reality to me when things like Israel and Palestine and Gaza break into the news, uh, talks of nuclear war and things. It becomes a reality to me then, but usually I'm separated from war growing up in this country in the time that I have. But you know, the Lord is, is never separated from a warfare mindset. It's part of his name. He's the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of armies. He really cares about the land on the earth, every land, because it's his land. The earth is the Lord, Lord's and the fullness thereof. He really cares about land. Um, he really cares about people that live in those lands, everybody in every land. He really cares about justice for all the people who live in every land. And he dispatches his soldiers and he intervenes into the earth on behalf of these commitments inside of him for justice. He cares about political and military leaders a lot. He knows what every political and military leader is thinking. He's constantly weighing that. The New Testament tells us that political and military leaders are in, um, uh, who are in authority are God's servants for our good. That's best case scenario. Or they are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Uh, I, I, when I read through the book of Jeremiah, I feel very conflicted every time I see him say, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. I go, ooh, <laughs> that dude's wicked and awful. But what it gives me the confidence of is that 
uh, despots like Nebuchadnezzar, horrible, horrific, evil, uh, maniacal people like uh, people who sit at the head of, of, of Hamas or Al-Qaeda, that they're not just rogue agents that the Lord is not using in some way. The Lord says, oh, I see them, and I see their evil, and I'm doing things about it, Jared, things that you don't see. He is Yahweh Tzavaot, and he constantly has a military mindset. Number two, what does Micaiah teach us about the throne room? It teaches us that the throne room is a war room. The throne room is a war room where strategies are discussed and agreed upon, where operations are planned, um, where generals and commanders are dispatched, right? Uh, the commander of the Lord's army goes and visits Joshua in Joshua chapter number five, sent from the throne room to go visit Joshua. A commander is sent down to the earth. The prince of Persia and the prince of Greece in Daniel chapter number 10 are, are sent down, right, with military strategies. The throne room is a war room. Um, Psalms 103, we, we read uh, last week with David. It says, uh, bless Yahweh, O you his angels, messengers, you mighty ones. Mighty ones is the givarim. They're, the, uh, they're like the generals uh, of heaven, the general of heaven's armies. Do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless Yahweh, all you his hosts. Those are the soldiers. Bless Yahweh, all you his hosts and his ministers who do his will. So when the Lord looks down at his angels, he says, this is my army. The throne room is a war room. And in the war room, we discuss strategies. We look at the earth and we react accordingly. Paul, using military language to talk about the, uh, the evil angels, the ones who have rebelled. He said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Uh, you can ask Pastor Ken afterwards, but each of those phrases can be uh, traced back to uh, some military language. Um, our church for the last 10 years has always had a, an eye on spiritual warfare because our lead pastor, Pastor Ken, um, taught spiritual warfare um, before he came here to this church, and then he's always kept it as a, as a present reality in front of us. This idea that that we are engaged in a battle. On January 8th of this past year, uh, we were worshiping. And in the middle of worship, the Lord spoke a word and he said, the Father's house is a kingdom outpost. And I didn't know what in the world that meant. The Father's house is a kingdom outpost. Now I know it connects to this idea that, that throne room worship is something the Lord has brought us into. Throne room worship is what Rusty and, and the team led us in this morning, right? Those are the types of things that we would say if we were standing in the throne room. It was beautiful. So as the Lord has given us this understanding of throne room prayer and throne room worship, well, if the throne room is a war room, then what are we, right? In the heaven is a war room and we are a outpost. So I said, Lord, what does that mean? And he said, ask Chris, right? Uh, so Chris, our deacon, uh, was in the military. And so I walked up to him after, at the end of the service. I said, hey, Chris, I just heard the Lord say this. What does that mean? The Lord told me to ask you. So he said, well, in outposts, uh, outposts are small bases used to rest, resupply, provide medical attention, and prepare soldiers to either re-engage or evacuate, depending on their orders. They serve as a foothold in a foreign land, a firm basis for further progress or development. An outpost is fortified with added security because they are under a constant threat of enemy attacks. And they are used as a staging point for missions. Every phrase there seems highly relevant to how the Lord has used us over these last several years. And so I went to the Lord with that understanding from Chris that the Lord told me to gain. And with this phrase that the Father's house is a kingdom outpost. And here's what I think I heard the Lord say. He said, you will reacquaint my soldiers with the weapons I have made for them. Supernatural weapons that are mighty to the pulling down 
of strongholds. You will live on the front lines. With boldness, you will stand against the enemy and advance my kingdom in your generation. We have been called to reacquaint the Lord's soldiers, believers who are now engaged in a spiritual battle. We have been called to reacquaint soldiers with the weapons that the Lord has made for them. There's a lot of soldiers in the Christian faith. There's a lot of believers who go through life never playing offense one time. They, they never take an offensive stance in war. They're constantly playing defense against lusts and against attacks and against the culture and against the government, against everything. They live like this, never picking up a, a, never picking up a sword, never waging actually offensive spiritual warfare. And the Lord said, one of the things that he's doing with this house, with this body, one of the things he's using us for is to reacquaint Christian soldiers with the weapons that the Lord has made for them. Weapons that are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Continuing with that uh, um, Martin Luther song, look at what he says in four. Oh, this caught me so much. Verse number four, it says, the word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, had to remind a generation that the spirit has been given to you. The gifts have been given to you. They're yours. Use them. They are your weapons. Imagine a church doing warfare without the weapons that God God died to give them. Imagine a church trying to do warfare against the enemy without prophecy, without words of knowledge, without the gift of tongues, without discerning of spirits so we can even know if the enemy's in the room. How can we know if a demon's in the room if we don't have somebody with the discerning of spirits, right? Imagine a church, a weakened church like A.W. Tozer saw in 1940. A powerless church is a church that doesn't even know that the gifts have been given to them for warfare. Prophecy. Knowledge, wisdom, that's an amen. I'm I'm an interpretation of tongues right now. That's an amen. Uh, Miracles, healing, these are our offensive weapons. And the church is being awakened and must continue to be awakened that the spirit and the gifts are theirs. They've been given to you. Now you can go throughout your entire life never using them, never using them for offense, not healing one person, never giving one prophetic word. You can choose to do that if you want, Chad. But the gifts are yours. You want to use them? You want to use them to fight the enemy? You want to use them to make a difference in this one little life that you have on the earth? You want to make the most of this life here? The spirit and the gifts are yours. Learn to walk in them. And then live on offense, the days of your life. Gone are the days of living months and years on defense. You only do that when you don't know what weapons have been given to you. But the spirit and the gifts are ours. Throne room's a war room. The church, every church, not just the Father's house, every church is a kingdom outpost. And one of the things we do in that outpost is we reacquaint soldiers with the weapons they've been given so they can go back out and fight and actually advance, in our king, advance the kingdom in our generation. Micaiah reminds us that the throne room is a war room. Number three, what does Micaiah teach us about the throne room? The throne room is accessible through the visionary realm. The throne room? The throne room is the control center of the universe. And you don't have to wait to heaven to access that in the spirit. Micaiah teaches us. If somebody says, what what, what are you talking about? You you, you have a vision of heaven. What do you mean you have a vision of heaven? That seems awful new, A.G. Just say, oh, turn to 1 Kings 22. I got a Bible verse for that. And then turn to Isaiah 6, where... Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. And then turn to Ezekiel chapter number one, where Ezekiel saw the throne room on the move, the mobile throne. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks. And then turn to Revelation chapter number four, when John was in the spirit and he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Like I have a Bible for it. If you want Bible verses for accessing the throne room through the visionary realm, I got a verse for that. Several of them. And Micaiah is a great one to start with. He teaches us that the throne room is accessible through the visionary realm. 
On the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, on the birthday of the church, it was announced that the age of the outpoured spirit would be dominated by spirit expressions once enjoyed primarily by the prophets, namely prophecy, dreams, and visions. On the day of Pentecost, on the birthday of the church, Peter said this is the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, guys. Prophecy, dreams, and visions for this age. This is for you and for your children. That's us. Prophecy, dreams, and visions were the ways that the prophets enjoyed the presence of the Lord. Prophets like Micaiah. He couldn't be a prophet if he didn't have a vision. He had to see into the visionary realm. He had to see into the throne room to be able to hear. Prophecy, dreams, and visions, once enjoyed by the prophets, are now democratized amongst all God's people. We can all prophesy. We can all have visions. And we can all have dreams from God. What a time we're living in. Throne room is accessible through the visionary realm. We spent a lot of time on prophecy and dreams, right? Uh, first, we started with prophecy. The Lord um, uh, taught us a lot about prophecy over the first couple years of our journey. And then it went to dreams, right? So for the last couple years, we've really been focusing on dreams. And my house, the Lord has blessed that. And then the third is visions. And my goodness, we've been using visions a lot. And our Rafa rooms have been heavily dependent upon uh, visions, Right? of presenting Jesus. And so uh, one of the things that we're doing is we are helping, well, first of all, it happened with us, and then we're helping others sanctify their imaginations. Our imagination is not just a place where we can play make-believe. Our imagination is not just a place where we can sin privately, right? Where we get to lust freely with nobody else knowing about it or fantasize. No, that's what the, that's what the devil tells us our imagination is good for. But we know now that our imagination is a sacred place a place that God created, a place that God created for vision so that the eyes of our heart could see things and that would be very helpful in living life, right? That would be very helpful in, in uh, redeeming memories and in forgiving people and in overcoming trauma. It would be very helpful in connecting to the throne room and hearing from the Lord and seeing how the Lord thinks about us. It would be very helpful in, in uh, our prophetic delivery to be able to see something that way we have something to say. And so we'll continue to teach on the sanctified imagination, to live holy before the Lord, so that way we're not assaulted by intrusive thoughts that are wicked. Uh, Joe, I point to Joe because Joe brought that up several weeks ago, and I haven't stopped thinking about it since. It was probably a couple months ago now. We talked about the intrusive thoughts in the intercession series. Intrusive thoughts. My life used to be dominated by wicked, intrusive thoughts. I mean, it happened all the time. It's probably because I watched like, I don't know, a thousand movies that I shouldn't have watched that, you know, put all sorts of horrible images in there. But the Lord can sanctify that imagination so you're not, your life's not dominated by these intrusive, wicked thoughts so that it's a clean slate, a canvas that the Lord says, okay, now that you're not fighting all that garbage, now let me give you a holy vision. A holy vision. Micaiah shows us real clearly that the throne room is indeed accessible through the visionary realm. Number four, I only have five points. Number four, in the spirit, we have a place before the throne. Micaiah tells us that. In the spirit, we have a place before the throne. Now, um, Micaiah, like anybody, had to grow in his throne room awareness, but he was taught this. He was taught that as a prophetic person with the spirit of God in him, that on the earth, in a spiritual way, he could stand on the earth and he could actually be before the throne. He could be on the earth, but in the throne room, in the spirit at the same time. He could have access to that space with the place that he stood on the earth. He learned this from Elijah. Elijah, whenever he prophesied, he would say things, you can look it up like in 1 Kings eighteen fifteen. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand then he would prophesy. And that's how he taught his prophets to prophesy as well. So Elijah's student, Elisha, in 2 Kings 3.14, when he prophesied, Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand. What do you mean before whom you stand? You're right here on the earth. I know. But as a man of the spirit, I can be on the earth, but yet be before the throne at the same time. 
He says, I know it doesn't make sense to you, much to you if you're not a person of the Spirit, but those who are in the Spirit know exactly what that means. They say, oh yeah, we, we totally understand that. How you can be on the earth, but in the Spirit at the same time, connected to that spiritual realm. Just as the angels, the hosts of heaven, had their place on either side of the throne, the New Testament tells us that now you, because you've been saved and risen with Christ, you have a place before the throne. Just as those angels did in Micaiah's vision. Now believers have that place. Look at the book of Revelation. There's believers all over the throne room. We know that's a reality right now. There's believers in the throne room. And Paul said, if you have been saved and risen with Christ, then your life is hidden with Christ in God. And where is Christ? He's seated at the right hand of God. So in a way, Dustin and Jess and Gabriella, you have a place before the throne. You have a place before the throne that nobody else can fill. It's your place. Just like Elijah had his place. Elisha had his place. Micaiah had his place. And every believer has their place. I don't know if it's got a number and a circle. I don't know, maybe, you remember how, you ever see like a, it's got like a picture of feet and they're like just the size of yours. Maybe they're just the size of your feet. Uh, I don't know. But you have a place before the throne. Hebrews 4.16, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God because you have a place there. We can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Boldly enter the place because you have a place there. It's your home, right? You don't have to knock before you go to your home, do you? You have to knock before you go into your house? No, you just open the door, right? You boldly go in because it's your home. You've got a place there. That couch has your indentation in it, right? It's yours. It's your place. It's your home. You boldly go in. You've got a place there. Hebrews 10, 22 Let us go right into the presence of God. Why? Because I have a place there. Just like the hosts of heaven in Micaiah's stream had had their place, they they felt awful comfortable to throw out their suggestions before an omniscient God, right? They had their place on the right hand and on the left, and you have a place before the throne as well. And lastly, number five. The throne room is open, and the one on the throne is taking suggestions. The Lord of hosts has no interest in ruling this world without um, the input of the creatures he's made. He could. He could not listen to one angel, one spirit, or one human and make all the decisions himself. He could do that. He doesn't want to. That's not the kind of world he wants to rule. He wants to rule a, a world where he collaborates. I mean, with the spirit, A spirit who's not omniscient? Yeah. Come here, spirit. What do you think? What a great idea to put a lying spirit in the mouth of 400 prophets. I think that'll go. Do it. The throne room is open, so go in. And the one on the throne is taking suggestions. Your opinion matters. Your voice holds weight in the throne room of God because of Jesus. Your, throne, your, your voice matters. Nobody else can make a suggestion you can make because nobody else has been given a brain that you have, has the history that you have. Nobody else can, can come up with the creativity that you can come up with. Your voice, no age, no gender, no degrees, your voice matters in the throne room. And the Lord says, I'm open to suggestions. You got a sick dad. What do you want me to do? I'm open to suggestions. You got a mess in your life. You got a suggestion? The, Lord, the one on the throne says, I'm listening. What can I do for you? Ask me. Make a suggestion, Joe. What do you, how do you want me to intervene? I'd love to hear what you think. As we start to gather on Wednesday for our 10 days of prayers, let us flood the throne room with suggestions, with requests. The Lord wants to know how creative we're going to be. He wants to know how hungry we are. Um, He's the one that said that he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you've ever asked or even thought 
according to the power of the Holy Spirit that's inside of you. Right? According to the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you've ever asked or thought. So why don't you just dream with him a little bit? Just dream with him. Micaiah's vision tells us, proves to us, that the throne room is open and the Lord is taking suggestions. So let's give them. 